So well, I know we have friends uh, trickling in for us uh, today. Uh, so, but I want to respect our, our time here. So good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Uh, we have uh, friends joining from multiple continents, multiple time zones today. Uh, I counted at least on the, the list of registrations. My guess was about 20, possibly 20 countries uh, are, are joining us here in addition to our panelists. So uh, I'm excited, very excited about that. Uh, and I feel especially for our, our friend Anne, who's coming all the way from, um, she's in Melbourne now, but right at present, but it's uh, close to 11, around 11 o'clock at night there for her. So, uh, but uh, so we, we will, are happy to have uh, people in all sorts of time zones here. Uh, my name is Kevin Ahern, and I'm happy to welcome you all to this panel, exploring the legacy of Dorothy Day outside of the United States. Uh, and so the, the program is being sponsored by Manhattan College, especially our Peace and Justice Studies program and Campus Ministry Social Action uh, programs here that have, that, that have a, several, a series of programs related to Dorothy Day. The, an international lay movement, series of lay movements of Catholic professionals called Pax Romana Ikmika, and the Guild for the Canonization of Dorothy Day, uh, which uh, I am connected to as well. We selected this day today, May 15th, because it is the day of the, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the day of the uh, feast day, and you will, as you will, of uh, the death of Peter Morin, who most of you probably are aware is uh, someone very close to Dorothy Day's legacy. So it's rather fitting in this month of May, uh, with uh, which is a special month for the Catholic worker to also uh, celebrate it on this day. And so we remember uh, in prayer today, Peter Morin. We also remember the, uh, and we will remember uh, Dorothy Day's granddaughter, Martha Hennessy, who is also a member of the Guild, who will be uh, released from her, from her pr prison witness in the next few days. So uh, we hope that transition goes well. Uh, we hope to have a second part of this session in the next few months, possibly in September, uh, linked to, to have more voices of Dorothy Day's legacy outside of the North American context uh, and to look to bring in some voices for, more from Latin America and Africa, uh, places where regions of the world where we, where we did not have a, a space or time to, to, to find uh, voices here for this panel. Uh, and so this panel brings together an intergenerational, uh, an intercontinental, uh, and an ecumenical group of activists who have been inspired by this journalist, activist, and possibly a future saint uh, in the Catholic tradition. So we are excited to have this conversation today uh, and to hear how her legacy is impacting the world and the church uh, beyond her hometown of New York. Uh, and so before we begin, though, I want to turn the floor over to Colleen Dulé from America Media, who will lead us in prayer. Colleen is also a member of the advisory board for the Guild. So Colleen, can you lead us in prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Loving God, you have gathered us from every corner of the world to reflect on the life and lessons of your servant, Dorothy Day. Give us a spirit of passion like hers a passion for justice, a fire in our heart that drives us to serve our brothers and sisters without counting the cost, a fire that continues to burn even when our work is difficult and we are worn out. Give us a love of peace and a commitment to nonviolence like Dorothy's. Give us the faith we need to believe that this world's injustices will not be solved with war, but with peacemaking. Give us your spirit that we might be the peacemakers you call us to be. Give us the grace to hear that spirit speaking into our conflict-ridden world. And give us reflective hearts like Dorothy's, that in the middle of the chaos of each day, our hearts may be places where your word dwells and echoes within us. May we come back to you often in prayer, even when we can only steal away for a moment. Let us always draw our strength from your deep wells of love. We ask all this through the intercession of your Dorothy Day and her co-laborer, Peter Morin, whose death we remember today, trusting that you will hear our prayer. Amen. Beautiful prayer, Colleen, thank you. Uh, before we get to our panel, it's it's really my pleasure to also to turn the floor to George Horton, who's the vice postulator for the cause for Dorothy Day's canonization and works with Catholic Charities in New York and coordinates uh, the Guild, uh, which is one of the sponsors here. So George will, will give a quick update on where we are in the process, maybe some uh, exciting, interesting developments happening, and uh, that will help to set the stage for our panel in a minute. Thank you, George. 
You're muted, George. George, George, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm getting used to these Zoom now after a, a year. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I'll repeat what you said. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to some of the people who have joined us for this wonderful discussion of Dorothy Day and the Global Church. Let me first say a word of thanks to Kevin Ahern for putting this webinar, webinar together. And as Kevin has mentioned, he and Colleen are faithful members of our Dorothy Day Advisory Committee. Thanks also to Manhattan College in Pax Romana who with the Dorothy Day Guild are sponsoring this event today. And of course, deep gratitude for our global panelists from the Netherlands, Philippines, Australia, and France. We look forward to hearing of your commitment and the perspectives you will bring to the life and legacy of Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker movement. We imagine and hope for a time when Dorothy's Memorial Day will be on the universal calendar of the church. My deepest thanks. Quickly on the canonization process, uh, let me say at the outset that many people believe that Dorothy is already a saint to be emulated. The canonization process follows as the official church inquiry and affirmation of that deeply held belief. The good news, there are two phases to the canonization process what is called the local diocesan phase, where the case for her canonization is prepared and evidence of her sanctity gathered. And the Roman phase, where that case is reviewed by the Congregation for Saints in Rome, and then a recommendation made to the Pope. The good news is that we expect that the local diocesan inquiry will be completed this year by the anniversary of her death, November 29. I'd like to make three comments on the process. First, the immensity of the task. Often we've wished that Dorothy hadn't written quite so much and that so much had not been written about her. Her diaries and letters alone, which all were handwritten, and in the archives of Marquette University constituted 32 square feet of boxes, which had to be unpacked, digitized, transcribed, and then carefully reviewed by officials of the inquiry. Many of you may know that New York City recently commissioned a Staten Island ferry boat. And we have jokingly thought we could use this huge passenger vessel to transport all the documents as precious cargo to Rome. We also would be going with the cargo uh, to Rome as well. I'm happy to say that the essential work of gathering and, and, and finishing the work on the letters and diaries has now been completed and custom arranged to Vatican specifications. I have to say a word of thanks to Phil Runkle of Marquette University, Jeff Corgan of our staff, and Dr. Joe Sclafani of the Ignatian Volunteer Corps for their assiduous work on these letters and diaries. The work of the Historical Commission and Theological Censors is nearing completion, as is the gathering of all eyewitness and expert testimony. So we're almost there and we expect to finish this year. Let me say something about our intentionality of keeping costs low. One of the early concerns expressed was the cost of the canonization process and that money could be better spent helping people who are poor. From the beginning, we have been intentional in keeping costs low. We did not have the resources of a religious order or large donor base in Dorothy's constituency, as you can imagine. We've had great support from the Archdiocese of New York, members of the Guild, and small grassroots donors have been our sources of support. In addition to the voluntary support of Archdiocesan cause officials, our historical commission, theological censors, Catholic charities, and Guild members, we have done this by engaging over 100 volunteers and the Ignatian Volunteer Corps 
in the work of the letters and diaries. Many of these volunteers who transcribe the written letters and diaries report a transformative experience encountering Dorothy Day through this work. 100 people took all these letters and diaries, the written and transcribed them for us. However, we continue to need your support. And I ask if you think you can help, please go to the Dorothy Day Guild Dot org website, and you can find ways to help. There also is an opportunity there for you to share any graces and favors you have may you may have received with Dorothy Dorothy's help. And there's an archive of the Dorothy Day newsletter. Finally, I have to say a word about the extraordinary cadre of people who have been involved in this process from the initial meetings with the Catholic workers and Cardinal O'Connor in the late 90s, with people who knew her and supported her canonization, including Adi Batun, Eileen Egan, Frank Donovan, to the establishment of this advisory committee to guide the process, including Tom, Monica, and Deirdre Cornell, Kathleen and Pat Jordan, Robert Ellsberg, Louise Wick, and Martha Hennessy. The support of Monsignor Greg Mustachulo, Vice Postulator, has been invaluable. One of the great gifts has been the involvement in our coming to know so many Catholic workers through this process. There have been bumps in the road. You can imagine that any process that involves the interests of the institutional church, Archdiocese of New York, and the Catholic worker movement might have some bumps. The prophetic and the institutional, long our challenge. But from the beginning, there has been a wind in our sails. The spirit of Dorothy Day has been present in the cooperation of the whole church in this effort. She stands as a saint for our times, and the model she provides of peace, justice, charity, hospitality, of the centrality of the Sermon on the Mount, in finding Christ in every person can help heal other divisions in our church, our society, in our world. One final note, when Pope Francis visited the United States, he mentioned Dorothy Day along with Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, and Thomas Merton as great Americans. And he inquired about the status of her cause. This interest of Pope Francis continues in Rome, and we have heard they are anxiously awaiting the presentation of what we have gathered in the local phase. The global Catholic worker movement evidenced here today can only bring greater impetus to the cause. Together we can say in the words which grace her Staten Island grave, Deo gracias. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, George. And, and thank you to God for uh, the witness of, of Dorothy Day, certainly. Uh, and uh, again, if, if you want to learn more about the process, I put the link in the chat, dorothydaygill.org. Uh, you could donate. You could also share any favors that you have. Uh, I think for many of us who are here today, we're probably are, we probably already have the, uh, you know, we've probably also been, already been sold on the importance of her legacy. And one of the things I'm most excited about as a college professor uh, and as a Christian is to share Dorothy Day's witness with people who've never heard of her before and to do that outside of just the, the United States and going beyond. And that's something I think uh, we hope with this webinar, but with other processes and other conversations that we can do and to spread the good news of what people are doing uh, inspired by her legacy. So with that, let's turn to our uh, wonderful uh, group of, of friends here gathered here. Uh, and I have three questions. I'll let them uh, introduce themselves in a, in a few minutes. And also then, uh, then we'll, we'll talk about their work and their, like, their impact, uh, how Dorothy Day has impacted them. So we have uh, Jared Mormon from, uh, from the Netherlands, from the Catholic Worker House in the Netherlands. Uh, Anne Dowling who's coming from Australia, from the Catholic Worker communities there. Uh, these are established Catholic Worker communities uh, for, for a bit. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Noel uh, Borador from the Nazareth House in Manila, a new community
community of Catholic workers that is uh, that is coming at, coming to fruition there. Uh, and Noel is associated is attached to the Episcopal Diocese of New York, so he's a missionary back in Manila working to to build uh, Catholic worker communities. It's a really interesting conversation we could talk about. Uh, and then I'm very excited also about uh, this new initiative that's 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 been created in Paris, uh, La Dorothy, and we have Henry Simeon here. So we have different generations and different communities working uh, for uh, for a, a new world or working inspired by this legacy. So let me let me begin with the first question for you all. Uh, briefly, ex briefly describe yourself, and and as you introduce yourself, uh, you know what was when did you first hear about Dorothy Day? That's I think a really interesting question. How did you first hear about her, uh, and why did she excite you? So let's start with uh, we'll go to the Netherlands first. So Jared, please uh, start us off. Okay, Kevin, thanks for uh, the invitation. How much time do I have? <laughs> How brief should yeah, I be? Yeah, for, we'll do a round of three or four minutes each, uh, or four or five minutes each on this first question, and then we'll, we'll go around, yeah. Okay, I, uh, I'm Gerard Mormon. Uh, I'm born and raised in the Netherlands. Um, in my late teens, I was looking again at, at religion. Uh, in uh, Amsterdam is a very secular city, and I'd, uh, I <laughs> called myself an atheist, but that, in my late teens, I started looking again. and. Uh, I was living in Germany at the time, and I was visiting my parents back home in uh, Amstelveen, the superb, superb. And I picked up uh, Time magazine uh, or Newsweek, one of the two, I don't know. It, it was December 1980. And uh, I was browsing through it, and I uh, stumbled upon the obituaries. Uh, and usually I skip obituaries, but for some reason I read them, and uh, Dorothy Day was in it. I'd never heard of her. But it sounded so interesting, uh, a woman of faith who had shared her life with the poor for many, many years, most of her adult life, um, living in poverty, uh, being arrested uh, seven times. And I thought to myself, that's the name I have to remember. So I, I thought, how do I remember her name? That was easy, Doris Day, Dorothy Day. And uh, a couple of months later, I was browsing through the library in uh, the local library, and I found uh, the one and only book that was ever translated of Dorothy, uh, Loaves and Fishes, translated by a Flemish uh, woman. Uh, I've never seen that book ever since, but um, it was about the beginnings of the Catholic worker movement. And uh, I was deeply impressed and um, I said to myself, if ever I go to New York, uh, I'm going to visit the, the Catholic worker. And uh, in 1985, I applied for the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Uh, it's a volunteer uh, program for college students, basically. And uh, they accepted me, even though I'm not uh, American. And uh, in fact, yes, after my first week of work in a soup kitchen in, Br in Brooklyn, I uh, visited St. Joseph's house. And uh, that, was, that was pretty much the start of my involvement with the Catholic worker. And, uh, I'm still at it uh, 35 years later. Great. That, yeah, it's a, that's a, it shows the power of, of the press in evangelization. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, and uh, so, and just, just an aside, we'll have room for question and answers after this. And uh, so if you have any questions for our panelists and or just in general, there's a Q&A button at the bottom, but there's also a space for you to write any comments or, or introduce yourselves if you want as a, a, an attendee in the chat. Uh, so, Anne, let's move over to, uh, to Australia. When did you first hear about Dorothy and how did she move you? Well, I'm exactly like Jared. I, I heard about her when she died. Um, an obituary was in our local, in an Australian newspaper. And I remember reading it and bringing it into my mom and going, I've never heard of this woman. I've been in Catholic school all my life. And she's amazing. Like to me, she just encapsulated the gospels as I understood them. And um, oh, I found it really exciting to read about her. But then, um, you know, my life got busy and it wasn't until I returned from overseas later, about five years later, looking for a community to live in common purse with who lived with um, an open door and lived with homeless people. That was kind of what I felt God wanted me to do with my life. Um, 
that I came across, uh, people started saying to me, oh, you know, find the Catholic workers. Um, so that was when I finally met a fellow, a, a Catholic worker. Who, so there was already a Catholic worker community that had been attempted in Brisbane. It had been going for a few years, but by the time I was looking, they'd folded. Um, but we managed to start up again, another Catholic worker community. So yeah, 35 years later, we're still here. Great. And uh, I, I got married to a fellow Catholic worker and we have seven children and uh, some of our children are in Catholic worker communities. And now we have grandchildren growing up on a Catholic worker farm in New Zealand. So we're into the third generation of Catholic workers. That's very moving and impressive. Uh, Noel, uh, when did you first hear about Dorothy and how has she impacted you? Hi, uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I was living in New York. I lived in New York for 42 years. So uh, maybe 30 years ago, uh, I, I, um, after I finished graduate school, I didn't know what to do with my life. So I took a job as a counselor in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And I worked with a homeless uh, agency, uh, working with um, homeless people um, with severe and persistent mental illness. And it was around that time that I started hearing Door Today because in the Lower East Side of Manhattan are the two houses, right? St. Joseph's and Mary House. But I never did go there in there then. Uh, but I met two Catholic workers who were working in my agency um, uh, as counselors as well. And nothing really spectacular about them. They were very ordinary people, but, but I was struck by their commitment and their courage to lead out their, their Christian faith in community, in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed. So uh, after my stint there, I wanted to go for further studies. So I went to California and interviewed there to, to get my doctoral degree, but I wasn't so sure anymore that's what I wanna do after working with the homeless people. And I was really struggling with it. I remember that uh, 30 years ago. Um, I remember after, after meeting with this Dominican friar, for my interview, I went to a bookstore. And the first book that came, that popped out of, out of bookshop is The Long Loneliness of Dora Today. And I purchased it and I took it back to New York and I was reading it on a plane. And that was, I think something spoke to me that, that when I went to New York, uh, I, I called the grad school and said, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your offer and your scholarship, but I'm not so sure anymore if I, I, I'm going to take it. So, I, so what happened was that I didn't take it and I ended up in social work school and, uh, and I was a social worker for 25 years um, um, because I, I felt Dorothy really made a convincing argument that to love, your, to love God, not just to study God, but to love God, you have to love your neighbor. Um, and I thought, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So I did, became a social worker and I thought that was enough. Okay, that was it. You know, I would love my neighbor by being a social worker, but there was this feeling that, that said that there's something else that, that is lacking. And I'm not sure what it is, uh, but I did not get involved with the Catholic worker movement immediately. Although I knew them, I had great admiration for them, but I was really scared to go inside a Catholic worker because I thought, they're really crazy. They're really a bunch of crazy, I mean, crazy in a bad way, but crazy in love with Jesus. And, and crazy enough for, for me to look at these people that they're willing to give up their lives. And I said, no, 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 that's, that's not for me. Not yet anyway. So, but God had other plans, but it took about 25 years for that to unfold. Great. There, there is a, there's a clear uh, sense that something, there's something new people are finding when they hear, first hear about uh, Dorothy, or at least those of us who, who are, our ears perk up because uh, there's something new here. So Henri, tell us about you and when did you first hear about, uh, hear about Dorothy Day? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, it's quite particular, I think, because, uh, you know, in France, uh, Dorothy Day and the Catholic workers are not so famous. So, um, in fact, uh, we discovered her life uh, in 2015 
uh, when two friends of mine, uh, Florian and Foucault, uh, they were based in Lyon, in the city uh, of France called Lyon, and they read about, uh, about Dorothy Day uh, in a cafe, uh, but this cafe, uh, in fact, is a, a Christian cafe. Um, it's called Le Simon. Le, Le Simon uh, has been uh, created uh, in the name of uh, Simon Weil, uh, who is a, a French philosopher. Um, and so they decided to, to have this cafe of interior intellectual um, uh, purpose and in this cafe they discover the life of Dorothy Day and they really realize that uh, we need to follow her life especially in France in particular for the French church I, I think I will uh, go, go back to, to this topic but uh, we re really realize that uh, we need to follow her, her life her model uh, in particular in France so it was quite funny because when uh, in 2016 we gathered um, uh, all together with uh, Foucault and Florian, um, so we were uh, 15 young French uh, Christians, and we decided to try to find uh, the woman or the man who will inspire and embody our project, which is uh, to create a new cafe in Paris. Um, and we decided to, to, I mean, to choose um, Dorothy Day, and they were a, a kind of competition with other uh, famous French um, model uh, of Christianity. But um, we decided to choose Dorothy Day because she has, uh, she had uh, a very specific life, and uh, which is very complementary, complementary to um, what we um, used to hear in France uh, regarding Christianity vis-à-vis uh, -vis also the, the, the French church. So maybe I, I just want to describe our project, which is uh, the Dorothy Cafe. So this is a, a cafe uh, which, is, uh, which has been created in uh, 2017. We first gather, uh, gathered in 2016, uh, so we were 15, uh, uh, roughly, and we, um, we are based in uh, the 20 e arrondissement uh, in Paris, which is a very um, uh, mixed uh, neighborhood, uh, meaning that uh, there is no homogeneity uh, among the population. Uh, there is... Uh, migrants, there is a, a strong uh, um, community of, um, of associations of, uh, of uh, people committed to uh, social uh, activities. So we, uh, we have, um, uh, we aim to, um, to be open to everybody. Uh, everybody knows that we are a Christian and we decided to uh, support this project through the prior, the, the priors, uh, our priors, our place. And um, uh, this is part of it to welcome the, all the people uh, from everywhere. And it was particular uh, this year with the COVID-19, because many uh, places were closed for, for the poor, but uh, here it was still open. And we also have a part of our activity related to manual uh, training, because we want to uh, offer to everybody uh, intellectual uh, matters, but also manual training, just to remind everybody that we are one. <laughs> so, um, uh, of course, we, we have these manual trainings uh, open to all, but we have also uh, conferences on uh, politics. Like uh, Dorothy Day, we try to, to explain the contemporary issues to everybody. So in a nutshell, uh, this is what we, we do and how we discover Dorothy Day. Great. And just, just a quick follow-up to that, Henry. Who are the people who come into the cafe? Can you just describe the people? Uh, so it's open to everybody. First of all, of course, we it was... Uh, um, mainly our network, uh, I mean, our friends uh, and all, but little by little, uh, it was the neighbors. And we really want to 
be um, inside the neighborhoods and not uh, from uh, the other part of Paris and from 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 everywhere because with with the digital development uh, usually people live far from from where they discuss or where, where they where they work and all but here we just want to to offer a place uh, for the for for the neighbors. Great, and, and the, I think the interesting thing that you mentioned, which is certainly part of Dorothy's legacy and the legacy of the Ceylon before that inspired that Peter Morin was involved in was that mix of the intellectual and the manual, the, the worker and the intellectual. I think that's really interesting. We'll, maybe we can come back to that. Uh, let's circle back and ask Noel, can you describe your uh, your the work that you're doing uh, and the organizations with the Nazareth House in, in Manila? Okay, so we're really tiny operation. We're so tiny that I sometimes feel we're, we're insignificant, <laughs> but that's okay because there are, you know, uh, that's you start small, and and we have a picture of Saint Teresa of Lisieux right there, big big picture of her, and to talk about the little way, right? So, in any way, uh, we are really a small house of hospitality for persons living with HIV and AIDS and are homeless. So uh, they come to us from another shelter, and 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 part of that is. They're supposed to stay only for six months until we get them. Well, no, they, they, they've stayed there for the duration of the entire thing because it's not just about, as you know, giving out charity, right? It's about forming community. And a lot of them don't have communities, don't have families who want them. So we become family. And sometimes I feel like I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I don't know, sometimes what I am. Um, so that's, that's what we do. Uh, we, we have a small community. Uh, we some we have what we call Dorothy's Kitchen. It's really not a kitchen, but what we do is we cook meals and and during the pandemic, because we have a huge lockdown, we will go out and, and give out food to the homeless. But it's again, it's a tiny operation, but it's something. Uh, what else do we do? Um, so basically, we also sometimes uh, uh, cooperate with other uh, religious and secular organizations especially around the issue for me, around the issue on the war on drugs. So within the last five years, 35,000 people have been killed. So um, don't know what to do, sorry. So I feel like it's really insignificant, but we have to say something. Uh, the other thing that we also get involved is the, 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 there's a drive to, to reimpose the death penalty. So um, we were part of, 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 of crafting a letter, uh, a, a religious letter, an ecumenical religious letter to the Congress and to the president saying, please don't do this. We don't need this. Um, so those are the three things that, that keep, keep me busy, keep us busy. Uh, and there's a, you know, because we're a small operation, that's enough for now. Um, um, I don't know where it's gonna go, um, but, but we have faith that somehow um, this is what we need to do right now. No, you, you mentioned, and, and thank you for, for your work. You mentioned the, the, the people that you're serving. Uh, many of them are, are your focus group, are people with HIV. Can you just yeah. spend a minute or two just describing what it's like uh, for, for those, those men and women, uh, those, those, those individuals in, in this context? Oh, okay. So, uh, well, compared, I, I used to, I mean, I chose HIV AIDS because I used to be an HIV AIDS. Um, uh, social worker in New York, as well as with the homeless and civilian mentally ill. So that's sort of like my forte. So, but it's it's one thing to be part as a to a social work agency, but it's one it's another thing to live. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just that we're we're giving them medications or we're paying for their health insurance. It's it's really trying to form sort of like a family where they feel like they don't have to be stigmatized. Our, 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 our house is not known in the neighborhood. Uh, I don't advertise or address because there's such a stigma and prejudice. Uh, sometimes people fear for their lives here. Um, so it, it is like a family. Um, and that's, that actually is the model for me. And that's the reason why in so many ways 
we're small because we have we want we don't want to go big that it becomes so impersonal. I think there's something about Dorothy in Dorothy's writing where I find that she really has that personal inter relationship with people who live in the house. Great. Uh, thank you, Noel. And uh, really a very interesting uh, to, to, uh, to hear about your work. And I was very impressed with what you said. It's not just about giving charity, it's about forming community. Uh, I think that's uh, very insightful. So, Anne, can you uh, share, share with us uh, a bit about the work of the Catholic worker in Brisbane, Australia, broadly? Uh, you might even be able to say something about New Zealand, which I know is not uh, the same. It's, a, it's nearby, but not too, too close. I know I've got a big job. There's so many different people from Australasia involved in the Catholic worker. Uh, doing so many different things. Um, I, we live on a sustainable energy farm where we make our own gas to cook with. We run our cars on straight veggie oil. Um, we have solar energy, of course, that's sort of goes by the by. And um, But there's a hospitality house in Brisbane that's involved with um, dumpstering and cooking for the homeless. Called food, they do food not bombs every week, the Catholic Worker community there. They have Refugees, a lot of refugees come through that house. Um, in Australia, there's not a lot of support from the government for refugees until they get refugee status. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of those people come through the house. I like Noel talking about um, being like a family because I think the big strength of Dorothy is um, her title, Friend of the Poor. And, and really that's what we are. Um, we have had long relationships with um, you know, Indigenous people, with um, you know, impoverished people, for homeless people. Um, that has carried on um, over the years. And, and I think that is the strength. They're our friends. We're their friends. Um, we go to each other's parties. Um, and that's the difference in the Catholic worker movement because... When it, it's very hard to categorize us. We're not a project that's being run. We're not a um, social work enterprise. Uh, we don't get paid. Um, and we, and, and a lot of times people found that difficult to conceptualize exactly what we were. They were going, what is this place? You know, and, and they didn't believe it was our home. We actually lived there you know, and, and they come and live with us. Um, that, that's a very different concept um, for helping, you know, people in crisis in the West. Um, it probably isn't in some other countries in the East. Um, so we're involved with climate action, um, coal mine. I had, I had to write a list because <laughs> there's so many different things. Um, there's a Land Forces Expo coming up, selling, uh, it's a, Weapons Expo coming up in Brisbane soon that we're involved with. Uh, Free West Papua, Right to Life. We're very involved in the pro-life movement. Uh, Free Julian Assange. Um, we do our own thing as well. We don't just join in with other people. We, we do our own sorts of actions because oftentimes when it comes to arrestable actions, um, there aren't a whole lot of people who want to do that. So uh, we often have a, a small affinity group that does arrestable actions on mostly anti-war and anti-abortion. Um, we have we had a first Catholic or second Catholic worker gathering recently for southeast Queensland. Um, oh yeah, we had a problem with our local archdiocese starting to introduce guns into the cathedral during uh, mass, and we've been in a campaign trying to stop that happening. Uh, Extinction Rebellion, we've had some connections there. Uh, some Catholic workers have, have taught um, nonviolence training. Um, one of our daughters is involved with uh, Christian peacemaking teams. I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, she's involved with them. She's going back to northern Iraq soon. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think I've a lot of environmental actions as well over the years that we've been involved with. Um, we punch it well above our weight for the small number of people that we are. 
and that, that's that's well put. And I think the difficulty to categorize Catholic worker communities is also extends in part the difficulty to categorize Dorothy Day, right? Uh, so, and people want to put her in a box or put the, the these these movements inspired by her in a box, and it's very hard to do so. Can you just speak a little bit about some of the people who are served by the by the direct actions of uh, in in Brisbane? I mean, what's who who would be who would be a target audience for for your friendship at this point? Uh, for friendships with with, with the, our yeah, actors what, or, the rea- or with the people. Yeah, what's um, the reality there? Well, I guess there would be a lot of people who are seeking refugee status, um, but there's also people with mental health um, crises happening that's ended them in the insecure accommodation um there's often there's um there's been single mums also in insecure accommodation situations or escaping domestic violence um yeah it's a variety we we don't um in in the brisbane catholic worker we haven't ever let people um, stay for too long if they're using drugs or alcohol. Um, we try, but then again, the Brisbane Catholic Worker at the moment had did go through a stage where they were very accommodating and trying to help people while they were trying to get off drugs, um, but that didn't work so well for them, for the Catholic workers themselves. <laughs> Um, and for the the tenor of the house as well and the home they were trying to create so uh yeah they the, i think they're being a lot more astute about you know where if people are using them they they can't stay there yeah so it generally tends to be people who are struggling with mental health or have insecure housing and needing supported accommodation yeah, yeah we think uh, think of uh, so many people in the world that are experiencing things like that. So thank you, Anne. Um, so to, to the Netherlands, uh, how is, what is the Catholic worker doing there? And, and what's, the, what's going on uh, with your effort to live out the mission there? Well, we're, uh, we're, we're a bit of an old community, I guess, uh, about the same time as Anne's community. We started in 1988 in a Amsterdam Southeast, which is sort of like a satellite city connected to Amsterdam with a by a metro line. But at that time, it was almost a no-go area. It was a very poor immigrant neighborhood. We're still in the neighborhood. We've had to uh, move several times, but uh, we're still in the same neighborhood. But it's, uh, it's it seems like it's gentrifying to our utter amazement. Uh, we, we never expected that. But anyhow, um, we, we offer hospitality to um, non-documented migrants, refugees, uh, men, women, children, uh, some anything. They're, they're from all over the world, uh, mostly from Africa, African countries at the moment. And um, it's long term. People usually stay quite a long time, uh, sometimes years until they get uh, some kind of chance to go on with their lives. Um, we've been blessed the last seven, eight years that we have had a core group that's, that's solid, uh, six, seven people. And, um, there around it, there's, it's a bit of a fluid thing now that I live upstairs. I'm not part of the core group, but I, I literally live upstairs and help out and I pray. There's a prayer life every day there's common prayers um but there's people in the neighborhood now that like me friends neighbors that help out and are f- a part of the family um uh, the our housemates uh the, everybody have, that's the one thing they say about it this is my family and i've come to realize how how horrible it is to be in a country where nobody knows your name nobody cares about you and just coming into a group where you are welcome and we, we know them. And that is, I think that's, that's, that is perhaps even the most important thing of what we do, the hospitality being 
brothers and sisters for each other, uh, celebrating uh, uh, each other's parties. Uh, of course, it's multi-religious. We have we have Muslims, so we the Ramadan just uh, ended, and um, we shared the iftar meals once a week together, and we celebrated. Uh, uh, I don't know what the English word is for the end of the uh, Ramadan, Sauerkraut in Dutch, but we celebrated that together, and um, that's really beautiful. I, I've always found that the most beautiful aspect that in the, the Catholic worker that it offers me as well the opportunity to become a brother or uh, older brother or uncle now <laughs> to many people that I would never ever uh, become a brother to, and. Uh, they don't, everybody spontaneously uses that word family. And uh, well, I already mentioned the prayer life, which is, uh, it's an ecumenical community. There's, uh, uh, let me see, a few Catholics nowadays, but many Protestants in the community. Um, we're very involved with the fight, uh, the struggle against the new uh, generation of nuclear weapons. Uh, being introduced in uh, the Netherlands and uh, Germany as well. We, there's a lot of contact with the German groups. Uh, Brot und Rosen in Hamburg is uh, a community very similar to ours. And there's, uh, there's many, many contacts. Um, and apart from that, it's, it's a bit like some of us are very involved with uh, Christian climate action, the Christian branch of uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, there's actually a new group that started uh, um, uh, last August, uh, sort of like a sister community of uh, five young people who left uh, the Jeanette Noel house and started the Dorothy community. Fortunately, nearby, it's about uh, 12 kilometers. Uh, we do everything on bike. We don't have a car. Uh, it's more of a rural community. They're starting up, and uh, but it's Dorothy because of Dorothy Day also, but they also chose Dorothy Stang, this um, uh, Notre Dame sister who was killed in Brazil for um, solidarity and activism with the uh, with the uh, rural farmers. Uh, so uh, I just just before joining this conversation, I looked at the Dorothy Day, uh, uh, the CatholicWorker.org website to see what's on all the groups that are springing up and there's many that are not yet on the list that's another sign i think of the strength of the catholic worker and the strength of the example of dorothy she's capturing hearts and minds uh, and there's friends of ours who are very inspired by this kind of life and want to do the same thing um, and they're, they're not on the list and they're but they're very much inspired by uh, so it's um, a great joy to see how things are expanding. I'd, I'd never expected this, uh, <laughs> uh, not even 15 years ago. That uh, We translated uh, Jim Forrest's biography of the Dorothy Day, All His Grace, into Dutch last year. Uh, it got really a lot of good reviews. Uh, I was very, it was a, <laughs> it's a lot of work to translate the book. But it was worth it. it. It got so much attention. And um, um, Henry, uh, Dorothy was not at all. <laughs> Nobody knew about her when we started in 88. And uh, it's slowly but surely uh, people are getting to know her. I think uh, she definitely has something to say in Europe as well. That's great. Yeah. And, and so we have about, I, th I think, probably 20 more minutes uh, just and I want to make sure that people, if they have any questions, can put uh, put them in the Q&A feature uh, attendees. And I know that some of the attendees, uh, maybe they've not heard of Dorothy Day before or not so well and others have, know, have known quite quite a lot. Uh, Jared, you, you mentioned something very interesting, which I hope we can follow up with maybe another conversation. Uh, some of these younger communities of people return, especially the 
in the who are attracted by the ecological justice uh, elements of the Catholic worker tradition and this vision of farming communes. Uh, and uh, that's something we can maybe tap into at some point that energy there, but one maybe give it to you all to see uh, and our Colleen or others too, or George, are there any other questions that you that you had about each for each other or, or comments on on the sharings that others have shared is there anything that strikes you so far. That you've any observations or interesting. Open up to a conversation between our panel. Anne, please. I just wanted to say, I think um, for me too, it's important that um, I've, I had a place to belong as a pacifist Catholic in the church, that Dorothy paved mm -hmm. the way for that for me and, um, and made me, gave me a group, gave, gave me a theology and a praxis around that. Um, so that was also that's also been her gift. But the famous quote that the Catholic worker is the farthest to the left that you can get uh, while still being in the church, or I forget uh, who it was the famous quote that uh, someone said at one point. Yeah, others. Yeah, sure. I think it was Michael Harrington who uh, who said that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a thing, I saw that there was a question in the question and answers uh, for, it's been there for almost since the beginning. It, it's an interesting question and... Uh, okay, you want to, can you do it, can you read it for us? Yeah, it's by Jeffrey Corgan. Uh, what elements of your own cultures have you found to be particular, particularly resonant with Dorothy's message and the Catholic worker movement? Uh, it, it's it's a challenging question, but I think for me the answer is quite clear. It's it's the radical hospitality and solidarity. It's the thing like uh, people are really touched that we live, that we 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 share life with uh, with people that are so down and out and have nothing, and that's something that impresses them and makes them curious about the rest. And uh, Holland is a very secular country. Uh, uh, it, but it's uh, very, very often people would uh, put your side if you if they find that you're Christian. It's 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 not a thing that will make you popular. But people are intrigued by this combination of a radical activism, radical solidarity, and faith. Uh, and it's especially this radical solidarity, sharing life, sharing everything. Well, not everything, but uh, a lot that uh, that um, impresses them and makes them open for the whole message, actually. Hmm. Yeah, Henry, yeah, please. It's, uh, it's, uh, the question is very interesting because it's uh, especially what uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, about the fact that Dorothy Day is uh, particular for, uh, for us because her life is very uh, um, accurate for, for our times. I mean, for, for, for the French church. I just have uh, three, uh, three or four uh, points, uh, but which are very specific to the French church. Because we, you know, in France, we have the principle of laïcité, but sometimes it, it is not very well um, interpreted, interpreted, <laughs> interpreted. Um, sometimes people think that laicity means you need to fight any religion, and you, everyone should uh, should not show uh, her uh, her or his face. And especially, uh, it's really the case for the social uh, um, activists. Sometimes they they, they are scared of uh, showing their face. Uh, they think that uh, people will say, "Yes, you are you are not open." You will just help the Christian because you are a Christian, and uh, so I don't know um, from where it's it, it stands, but uh, it's like that in France. Maybe it's uh, the influence of uh, of the past, of course, of, of the community uh, communism, but uh, we have a lot of examples of uh, Christian foundations which decided not to show their their Christian part. <laughs> And uh, it was the beginning of our uh, of our thinking with our team. 
uh, that we really need in France to show that we, you can articulate your um, face with your uh, social and political uh, views, your uh, actions. And uh, on the contrary, on the opposite, uh, it, it helps you to uh, make lasting um, foundation, lasting actions. And without uh, praying, without uh, the help of, of Jesus, you, you cannot um, do lasting action. And um, this is this uh, very precise point uh, which pu push us to choose Dorothy Day. There is also the fear of communu communitarism, sorry, in France. When you speak about community, uh, people think that you, you are a close community, you will only uh, focus on your community and you are uh, competing with the national community. And uh, so you are a source of division. And again, Dorothy Day shows, showed that uh, it's the, the opposite. I mean, when you uh, assume your face, when you, you, you have a strong community, but an open one, uh, you can do uh, greater things, and uh, you can fuel you can fuel the national com community. So again, it was a particular pillar for us. There is also the role of the states in France. Uh, the Fr uh, in France, the states is um, I mean plays a central role in the social sphere, and uh, Dorothy Day is. Uh, a woman who, who, who choose uh, not to uh, to ask for tax for um, for subsidies for all this stuff. So we decided to do the same and to show that we can do social things without the support of the state. And sometimes you need to be independent from the state to um, express or convey mm -hmm. a particular political message or social messages. So it was important for us. And the last point is about uh, the current uh, crisis within the church of, of course, uh, the abuses, the sexual and um, poor, poor uh, abuses that we, we discover. So people in France need to see that you, you have a diverse church. I mean, you just, you don't have only clergymen and uh, of course, they, they are central, but um, we can do st things without the parishes. And we try with the Dorothy Cafe to be somehow a parish outside of the church or a, a parish uh, in the margin, like um, uh, uh, Pope Francis asked us to do, uh, to, to, to go in the margin, in the periphery of the society. So all these uh, points uh, push us to go towards um, the life of uh, Dorothy and to choose her as a source of inspiration. Uh, that's that's great. Uh, Noel or, or Colleen or George, I think, what do you, any response, Noel? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just like to say, Oh, sorry, Noel first and then George. Sorry, yeah, Noel. Uh, Dorothy Day um, quoted uh, John of the Cross, uh, where, where there is no love, put love and you will draw love, right? That's one of her favorite quotes that I also carry with me. I mean, somebody just say, said that the Philippines is a semi-failed state because we could not meet the needs of the people here. We're, we're a third world country. Uh, there's vast inequity. Uh, we don't even have the same things that's happening in, in the United States in terms of the vaccine, things like that. Um, one thing that resonated me about Dorothy Day was saying, well, you know, her anarchism. Okay, good if you have the state, but don't rely on the state to do that. <laughs> you, you have to begin personally doing something, even so small. So I think that resonates in our culture because with all the, the pandemic going on with the, with the fail, failed economy here, people right now are doing things on our own. Uh, 
uh, to take care of each other, the sense of community, the sense of solidarity. I think that resonates very well with 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 Boris today. Okay, so let let's take care of each other. Let's not wait for for somebody for the, uh, Peter Morin to say. Let's not wait for the welfare state to take care of us. Uh, obviously, we would need the government, but if we don't have it, then we need we need to be per, we need personally to 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 reach out to one another. And I think Jared talked talked about the vast solidarity among us. Great, George. Yeah, just quickly, uh, Kevin, I, I have to say, I'm feeling wonderful hope here this morning. Um, you know, the, it looks pretty dismal out there in so many ways with the sin of racism and militarism and the, 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 the pandemic. Uh, the incredible poverty and war, I, and all of a sudden a light has gone on this morning, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the hope that I feel uh, from this conversation against an incredible odds. So thank you. I just wanted to say, um, Jerry used a phrase, and he said, becoming brother and sister um, to people that I never thought I would be. And that, that hit me with great, great power, because I think Dorothy Day, like Francis, is asking us to cross boundaries, cross barriers, as people are crossing boundaries and barriers to us. And to me, that sense that we can meet each other and meet, again, Christ in each one of us uh, from the Christian perspective, I, I'm, I'm very grateful and very moved by that. So, again, thank you. Great. Before we get to some of the questions, Colleen, is there anything that jumped out at you so far? Um, I just wanted to go a little bit deeper on one thing, which is um, Henry was talking about how the Dorothy Cafe has, you know, kind of a, an intellectual mission. And I was wondering when you're having these conversations with people, when you're, you know, having these discussions that the cafe is meant to foster, what are the things about Dorothy that tend to really resonate with the people that uh, are at the cafe. So, in fact, we uh, propose uh, um, each uh, week a conference, uh, but we try to uh, find a new angle, a, a new point of view um, for each topic. Sometimes we choose a topic such as uh, agriculture, uh, agricultural topics, which are um, sometimes less discussed uh, in France. Um, sometimes we, we wanted to uh, discuss about death because we know that this uh, topic is very well uh, neglected because we, uh, everybody will die, but nobody wants to speak about it. Um, all these kind of uh, discussions. We also um, uh, discuss about international crisis um, I am a, a diplomat, so I, I try to share my comp competence, my skills for, 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 for this cafe. And um, we communicate uh, on these conferences, but obviously, since we uh, welcome everybody and also mental ill people, uh, also undocumented people, um, refugees, um, like you, uh, we explain to them what will happen on Thursday, because this is the day of the conference, and um, invite them to, to, to be part of it. So sometimes it's a conference uh, presented by a specialist, but we really like to uh, ask uh, members of the team to, um, to, to also um, make their own presentation to be uh, uh, access, uh, accessible. And just to mention uh, in our project, I mean, we, we are a team of members, of, uh, 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 volunteers who, who decided to uh, move, uh, to live just near the cafe. So it's not just a social, uh, you know, association or commitment like that. It's uh, an extreme <laughs> decision because you you really uh, focus your life on this uh, commitment. And many of us uh, decide to walk around the neighbors 
uh, the neighborhood of the cafe. So, so it's really uh, uh, an extreme <laughs> way of uh, being uh, committed. Great. So we have three uh, new great questions from our from our participants, uh, and uh, maybe uh, we'll uh, we'll sort of we'll we'll take we'll take these three and, and that should cover a lot of it. Um, and whoever can answer, wants to answer can answer. So one is uh, from uh, Tony Pitchler, who just who talks about that he is an associate, they're an associate with a religious community whose charism is inclusivity. Uh, knowing the Catholic worker is not a religious community per se, uh, what would you say is the charism of the Catholic worker movement? Uh, and maybe uh, for Jared or, or Anne, who've been around for, for a while with, with the workers, I don't know, I'm sure you've had debates about this, but uh, what would you say is the charism of, of the worker movement? Shall I start, uh, Anne? Yeah, uh, please, yeah. <laughs> I find it a, a bit difficult to say, but for me, the unique thing about the Catholic worker is the combination of um, of faith, uh, radical direct action, poverty, and sharing uh, sharing your life with others. Uh, I've never found it anywhere. There's many similar movements, which I love. Uh, the Emmaus movement, I was involved, uh, uh, Abbe Pierre's movement. Um, uh, but I've never found this particular combination of strong and even though there's um, the, the, the disadvantage is, is that we don't do anything really well. We, we pray, but it's a struggle to pray well because there are so many. Uh, so, um, and being, we're very much part of the church, which I think has been, uh, redeeming grace, we, we, we get so much support from the church, we get a lot of support from religious communities, we feel very close to the Benedictines, uh, nearby Benedictine community, and I admire the solidity of many uh, religious orders, And but I think there's a wonderful uh, relationship of, uh, of support and prayer, and uh, they support us, we get so much support from religious communities, and uh, I, I think they're really inspired by what we do. So, <clears throat> uh, and there's a lot of uh, contact. Uh, it's it's a long answer. I hope uh, <laughs> I hope it's a bit of an answer to the question. And I give I give the word. I'll give you. Uh... I suppose it's the attempt to have faith in action, to to live your faith um, in an active way. Um, and I think what Jared said about poverty, um, living simply, it is pretty radical in the West. I mean, we certainly, um, we look poor in the West, but we're not poor on a global scale. And we like to keep that perspective for ourselves and for our children as well, who can feel like they're, you know, that they, they suffered because we were not, um, as well, you know, equipped as people around us. But, um, yeah, so I think it is the living simply and and being a friend to the poor that um, a live-in friend as well, that we actually share our lives with them, is, uh, is something very different. Marianne Donahue Lynch, who works with the De La Salle brothers in the United States, reminds us that it's also a feast day of Jean Baptiste De La Salle, who uh, obviously uh, had, was an impact on Dorothy's understanding through Peter Morin and through her connection with the various La Salle communities uh, in and around New York. Uh, but I, I want maybe I'll take these, read these last two questions, these other two questions here, uh, and have you all. Um, respond uh, and and Colleen too uh, if you want uh, and so Saint Saint Dor so this is a question from uh, Nikos uh, Kosmodilas who has a beautiful icon by the way of Dorothy Day you could search his name and uh, he's a um, young activist in Greece a Greek Orthodox who uh, has made a beautiful icon of Saint Dorothy so uh, Saint, Saint Dorothy cultivated a radical view of issues of injustice with her traditional understanding of respect for human life 
do people in your context find it challenging to accept both sides of this in your ministry without choosing one or the other? Uh, Anne, I think, hinted at the the, the fact that, the, at least in Australia, there's a strong commitment to the pro-life and anti-war and th crossing these these uh, often binaries of conservative liberal, which uh, we, we know don't always fit in Dorothy's life. So that's one question. The other question uh, relates to about uniting the Catholic worker movement internationally and the challenges around that or the interesting question about uh, connecting uh, the workers uh, beyond just the local community. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll we'll have those as our last sort of go around if, if anyone wants to feels called to respond to the one of those questions. Noel, you were shaking your head at, at, at one of them. Uh, do you have a response to either of those? Um, the, the first one is um, about um, life, right? Um, St. Irenaeus says that the glory of God, Gloria Dei, is a human person fully alive, uh, not, just, not just in terms of, of uh, uh, physical, although that's, that's the underlying thing, but all around in terms of of the, the economic, the social political uh, 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 part of that person. So it, it's, it, uh, I think Bernardino had that, that, that seamless thing, right? Uh, garment of life, right? That they're all connected, right? So why, why do you have to choose between both? Uh, it, it's, I, I don't, I think we want life in its fullness, as Jesus says, I came to, I came here so that you may have life in its fullness, physically enough. Fun question, fun fact, Cardinal Bernardine took the idea of the seamless garment from uh, Eileen Egan, who was a oh. member of the New York Catholic Worker. So that idea in many ways stems out of the worker, the Catholic worker on the Dorothy Day tradition. Uh, yeah, other responses to, to one of those questions about the, the challenge of bridging those different aspects of life. I think Noel gave a great answer uh, to that and or of the challenge of organizing uh, an anarchist uh, movement. Yeah. Well, I'll just like to say it's been very useful being the bridge between those two groups, you know, the anti-war and the pro-life and being on both sides and seeing how both sides operate and just being a voice for the other in the other camp. Um, that has been like that has been a real gift of the Catholic worker movement in, in Australia that we've been able to be that voice. Otherwise, I think they can just write off that side. The other side, they never meet anybody. The pro often the, the anti war people never meet a pro lifer, and the pro lifers never meet an anti war. But I've marched beside Vietnam vets in, in March for the Babies and had conversations um, about it. And, and because we're actually very strong on both, that's also useful because we have respect from both sides. So in our, yeah, that's great. So in our two or three minutes left, other responses? Henry, yeah, please. Yes, uh, just to explain again the peculiar uh, situation in France, I think politically, uh, I mean, France society, as well as the, the, the community of the Christian, of the French Christians, they are divided roughly into two and the pro-life, uh, Somehow they are from the bourgeoisie a little bit, and uh, it's difficult for them to be connected to the the poor, to the the fight against uh, uh, the poverty and uh, and all these uh, matters. While in the left, you you have the Christian very committed to to fight against poverty, but they have less. Um, um, I don't know, less uh, motivation to fight uh, for, uh, for, for, for life, uh, for the respect of human life from the beginning or, or to the, the end. So um, again, like Anne, I, I would say that uh, we try to, to put this bridge between the two because again, we, we are one and, and, and it's, uh, as Noel said, it's connected, I mean, uh, obviously, so, um, but it, it will take time, and we are in the in in a left, so to say, a neighborhood. So, first of all, we are trying to show that we are a Christian, a Christian, 
not from the bourgeoisie style and we try to be among the poor and then we will try to show that uh, yes you you can see from another point of view this case, question of uh, uh, respect of life great colleen do you have any thoughts on on some of these things <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just have to say, like, first of all, I'm, I'm bowled over and like, so admire and feel so much of the hope that George mentioned just by hearing all the things that you're all involved in. Um, you know, my experience as a Catholic worker has only been in the United States. And so to see the way that you're facing some of the same challenges and trying to overcome some of the same challenges too, uh, is really good. I also wanted to, like, say briefly, I, I appreciate being able to see this morning all of the different ways that people can take Dorothy's message, Dorothy's lesson, Dorothy's witness and run with it. You know, there's no one way to be a Catholic worker. There's also no one way to, you know, try to follow Dorothy's example, right? Like in my own life as a journalist, I try to, you know, find different ways that I can, uh, yeah, try to, I guess, follow her example in some ways uh, in, in journalism, right? Which is completely outside the Catholic worker world. So, it's just been really, really interesting and enlightening to, to hear what you've all had to say. Um, I guess on this latter question uh, on uniting an anarchist movement, I, I don't know, I'd be interested to know what you all think, because from my reading of Dorothy, you know, it, it kind of seems like, um, like she might just prefer for each community to do its own thing and not try to build a, uh, a big overarching like cause together. You know, she seems to be a lot more focused on the local, the personal, um, and sort of has an allergy to, uh, to any, I guess, lack of subsidiarity, right? Why do it on a higher level when you could do it on a more grassroots level? Um, so yeah, I'd be curious, you know, for y'all who are actually working in, in the movement and related areas, what do you think? Yeah, Jared, please. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a difficult question. Uh, uh, how do you get a group of uh, pretty anarchistically inclined people to, uh, to organize something together? It, 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 it does not happen on an institutional level, but there are strong uh, ties between communities. And where I see it, it does get together is in the fight against nuclear arms. In Europe, it's interesting that uh, for, for many years in Germany at the, the site of the nuclear bombs in Büchel, there's been Americans coming out of sort, I guess, a sort of uh, sense of the, these are our arms. Uh, the, this is our government placing them here. And there's the Germans and the Dutch. Um, it's interesting that we've gotten together around this issue and uh, done these actions together now for, for, for several years and again, there's going to be another action uh, later this year in Buchel. Um, and finally, we're getting, we're getting the, what is it? Some of us are, have, have gotten really stiff uh, prison sentences. Uh, some of us in the community, so we have to figure out who's going first, uh, that the whole community doesn't collapse when uh, too many uh, end up in prison at the same time. But, uh, but that's an action where internationally we get together in a very uh, grassrootsy way. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, obviously a, a long struggle here. Uh, we're going to close in just a second, but uh, I wanted to give the words of this, give space for a minute or two if anyone, any of our panelists, have any last um, insights or last words. Henry, please. Just to say is that we are uh, we have uh, translated. Um, the, the autobiography of Dorothy Day um, two years ago, I, I guess. And we also uh, wrote a biography of her, uh, which was edited in 2018. So we are uh, trying to make her more famous in France because, as I told you, it's not the case. And um, I mean, some national newspapers also uh, wrote more and more about this. Uh, her, her life, thanks to these books, but also uh, thanks to uh, the mediatization of our uh, actions uh, in the cafe. So thanks, Colleen, to show this book. Thanks. A lot. That's great. Yeah, wonderful. Others for last words. Noel or 
Well, uh, well, I think, Noel, any last words before we wrap up? No, okay. Well, I think, so, so I think as we, as we uh, close, I, I think we have to really remember uh, all the people that are, that are in uh, serious crisis right now in our communities in the, in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis and the economic fallout. Uh, we think especially about the, the people, the men, women, children in, in uh, Israel and Palestine at the moment, uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in all the places where, um, where people are in need of, of the works of mercy. Uh, and I think today we saw, at least I saw, uh, some examples of the works of mercy in action. Uh, and there are many more things like that. There are there's a lot of good news coming up in the church. And maybe as a way to end, I, I just want to draw a quote. I'll put it in the chat. And this is a quote from uh, Pope Francis's uh, exhortation, uh, Gaudate in Exaltate. Uh, and here on number 63, he says, and when I read this, I thought of, I thought of Dorothy Day. There can be any number of theories about what constitutes holiness with various explanations and distinctions. Such reflection may be useful, but nothing is more enlightening than turning to Jesus's words and seeing his way of teaching the truth. Jesus explained with great simplicity what it means to be holy when he gave us the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are like a Christian's identity card. So if anyone asks what we must do to be a good Christian, the answer is clear. We have to do each in our own way what Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Beatitudes, we find a portrait of the master, which we are called to reflect in our daily lives. Uh, and I know uh, that, uh, that many of us uh, resonate with, with this challenge for us. So uh, thank you all to our panel who are uh, living this uh, identity card, uh, the Beatitudes identity card, uh, and we will be in touch. And please go to dorothydayguild.org for more information on the work of the Guild and how you can support our efforts going forward. Uh, thank you all and have a good afternoon, evening, and good night, Anne and others, uh, as you go to sleep. Thank Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.